Welcome to The Spotlight, the podcast where veterans and military spouses connect and share how their military experience has transformed their lives and their businesses. Here's your host, Bob Loudon. Hey, this is your host, Bob Loudon, founder of the Veteran Crowd Network, the network that brings veterans and veteran-led businesses together with each other and the resources they need to prosper. And you are tuning into the spotlight. And now a word about a Veteran Crowd Spotlight partner, Fund the First. Fund the First is the nation's leading crowdfunding platform for first responders, military, and medical professionals. Thanks to a partnership with IDME, Fund the First is able to combat fraud and scams to ensure donors that money is going to a verified and trusted source. Visit fundthefirst.com for more details. Fund the First, crowdfunding for our nation's heroes. Hey, welcome everybody. This is your host, Bob Loud, and welcome to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. Pleased to have Linda Maloney today as my guest. She's currently the CEO of the Women Women Veterans Speakers Agency. She's written a book and she is a veteran of the United States Navy, a former naval aviator. And I think you were the first woman ever to be ejected out of a ejection seat in the Navy. Is that correct, Linda? Oh, so I Welcome. don't, thank you. I don't think I'm the very first. I am, there were, I think there was at least one other woman um, before me in an A4, uh, maybe 10 years before I ejected. But um, I definitely was the first woman in the Martin Baker seat who has oh, okay. had over seven, I think 7,000, maybe might be 7,400 ejections. I'd have to check their website, but I was their very first woman um, back in 1991. Oh my goodness. Well, we got to start with that. Um, take okay. us back to that day. Um, boy, that must have been an interesting day burned into your memory. A absolutely. I, as a matter of fact, I always say that I'm more afraid of it now looking back on it because I definitely have a lot more life, you know, behind me. And when you're young, I think that you're, you know, you're not afraid. Like you're just, especially when you're a young military aviator and kind of cocky and think you can, you know, do anything. Um, but um, it was a kind of warm, sunny February day in Key West, Florida. That was my first duty station. I was flying in the A6. Interesting about the A6 that we were flying in is I was in a support squadron. It was before the combat exclusion law was repealed. So that meant that women could not fly in combat. And I eventually did fly in combat. But at that time, I was in this support squadron. And what we did was train the fleet and trained ships and other aviators on what the bad guys look like, on what the enemy look like. So we would fly, you know, um, enemy missile uh, profiles. You we were the op four, so to speak. Yeah, and we would simulate enemy radars and enemy, um, you know, missiles, and um, and we trained the fleet. And so that's what we were going to do that day. We were going to, uh, with another A6, fly as a flight up uh, to Jacksonville, Florida from Key West. And um, we would fly against an aircraft carrier up there and we would do our missile runs, our radar runs, and then we'd go back um, in for some gas at, I think it was Patrick Air Force Base. And um, we would go back out in the afternoon, uh, redo that whole scenario, and then RTB return to base back home to Key West. And um, that was our mission. So we got half of the, um, the day complete, we were pulling off of the aircraft carrier and I was calling, you know, hey, see you later. We'll be back uh, this afternoon. Um, we're RTB over to Patrick Air Force Base. Um, and all of a sudden the aircraft kind of shuttered, you know, it was kind of like that weird zero G feeling, you know, when you go up in an elevator and settle mm -hmm. back down. Mm -hmm. And um, and then simultaneously, all the master caution, a bunch of master caution lights in the aircraft started flashing. And we immediately recognized that we had a hydraulic system failure. And the A6 has two um, main hydraulic systems and it has a backup system. So um, the, the funny thing is, is that, you know, women weren't allowed to fly in combat because the, the 
you know, they didn't want us to be, you know, captured and brought home in body bags, but we were flying the oldest aircraft in the military. <laughs> so, so our, you know, it's, it's kind of, I, I kind of laugh about that now because, um, you know, it, we had emergencies all the time in those aircraft because they were very old. But um, so we, I pulled out my checklist, our pocket checklist, and um, we talked to the other aircraft that was with us and, you know, told them we had an emergency. We called air traffic controller and our call sign was Gulf Delta 110. And we said, hey, this is Gulf Delta 110. We're declaring an emergency. Um, you know, we need to take an arrested landing. And so instead of going to Patrick Air Force Base, we wanted to go over Navy Cecil, which had arresting gear. I don't know if um, Patrick had arresting gear, but we knew for a fact that, that Cecil did. And so we started heading that way. And um, we probably were about 15,000 feet, 270 knots headed west. And, um, it, and, you know, I don't remember the time um, that this, you know, how long it took from beginning to end, but within, you know, another 30 seconds, you know, more master caution lights came on. Um, it was evident we had lost the other hydraulic system. My pilot, Stan Parsons, um, he had, you know, I think it was left full rudder, right full aft on the stick. And he said, I don't have control eject. And I looked at him and I said, what? <laughs> and he said, he repeated himself. He said, I don't have, because I mean, you're trained for emergencies, but when, you know, it actually comes to that where you have to eject, you know, it was startling to me. And so um, I, in, in that version of the A6, we did not have command eject. Like I couldn't pull the handle and he went also. In that version, you had to pull your own handle. Some aircraft in the later versions of that A6, it did have um, command eject. So, and also I think as an aviator, you probably envision what ejection handle you're going to pull. And the A6 in the Martin Baker seat um, that we had, you could either pull a lower handle or an upper handle. And I just always thought to myself, I would pull the upper handle just because of like, I was, you know, I was not a big person and just like power wise, I thought I would pull that upper handle. So that's what I did. Um, I pulled the upper handle and um, in the A6, you actually go through the canopy. Your seat rides up the rail, you bust through the canopy, whereas in other aircraft, the canopy blows first. And sure. yeah. so it doesn't have like an explosive charge to break the canopy or anything. there's an explosive charge at the bottom of the seat, which basically, you know, but not on the canopy itself. No, there's like on the top of the um, the seat in an A6, it has these canopy breakers and it's like these these little bumps on top of the seat. And so <laughs> when the seat hits the glass, it shatters it. And so I remember riding up the rails and, and Stan, my pilot, he remembers that my knee board, which had yellow, a yellow pad of paper on it, it just like, you know, went out like confetti. There was yellow paper everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, and so in um, most ejection seats, I believe there's a, you know, barometric pressure device where it causes you to have seat man separation. So let's say that you eject at 20,000 feet. You're not going to get a canopy until, you know, a parachute until you're down around 11,000 feet. And so you'll fall, you'll free fall until that, or you could beat the seat. You could pull the handle and then beat the seat, push the seat away and get your parachute. Well, since we were at around 15,000 feet when we ejected, our aircraft was headed straight, rolling, it was rolling um, straight down. Um, you know, we were around that um, altitude anyway. So I passed out and mm. I came to whenever the, I felt the did parachute. Did you get knocked tug. out or did, is it, was it the G forces? Don't know. I don't know. Mm. Um, so, um, but I did come to whenever the, the, you know, I had a full parachute. You get, you get uh, picked up. I mean, was it, were the rescue people surprised to pick up a woman? So, um, well, I, when I got into the water, about 10 feet above um, the water, I put my hands up on the Coke fittings and you're, you know, to release the parachute because you don't want it coming down on top of you. And so I got into the water, I got into my raft. You have a raft that's attached to a lanyard to mm -hmm. your, your sea pan. So I released that, it, it inflates, I got into my raft. Um, I started looking at all my stuff, you know, all my stuff in my seat pan, all my goodies for my survival gear, pulled out my radio. That was the only day I did not pre-flight my radio. I always pre-flighted my radio and my radio was dead. 
no no and yeah so um there's so, a life lesson in that one right oh uh, yeah that was yeah that was um so I, I i estimated i was in the water about an hour but within that hour there was a large prop aircraft a p3 circling overhead and i had also released into the water a sea dye marker which i think was fluorescent green it was either fluorescent orange or green and, and that what, goes what out for miles Island? what about your uh, your partner there I did not see him eject. I hoped that he had. We ended up being about five miles apart from each other. How about that? And we got picked up. So anyways, there was a P3 overhead rocking its wings, doing a figure eight. So I was very grateful because I knew that they saw me. <laughs> and so within minutes after didn't that. Didn't break any bones or anything? No, but I, um, a couple of things that I, that I did wrong, <laughs> you know, and I heard about it later is that I did not have my gloves on a lot. Of, I had gotten into a habit and some aviators do when you get airborne, take your glove, your gloves off. And then when you get ready to land, you put your gloves on, snap your, you know, mask up. So I did not have my gloves on. And in the haste of the ejection, uh, I did not put them on. And so when I ejected, um, every single knuckle was cut in my hands and um, and I also had a hole almost all the way through my chin when I smacked myself in the face so hard on the way out and um, but other than that I was I was okay mm -hmm. and um, so but um, right before I got picked up with the helicopter I had shot off a couple of pencil flares and those aren't I mean those aren't very significant in the daylight it was about one o'clock in the afternoon but uh interestingly i met the pilot of the helicopter who um rescued me years later when my book was published and he and i talked on the phone and he said hey i have something to ask you he said um was your radio really dead and i said yeah why he said because we were calling out over the radio golf delta 110 pop your smoke he said within us um, a second of us saying that your pencil flare came directly in front of our helicopter he said you must have had somebody looking out for you that day yeah because he, he said it was very hard to see you know the you know a, a raft in the water but the um the SAR swimmer the search and rescue swimmer repelled down out of the helicopter swam over to me and asked me if I was okay and I think he was very surprised that I was a woman and um, he wrapped me up in the horse collar, you know, gave a thumbs up and, um, uh, you know, I was um, hoisted up into the helicopter. And so he and it was I. It was winter time, was it? It, wasn't, it was. was it, it was February. So the water was about like it was right on the edge of having to wear a dry suit. Right. But you weren't wearing one. Nope. Uh, and I don't, um, think, I don't think many aviators like to wear the dress. No, they're suit. terrible. They're really terrible. Yeah. You, but yeah. You you didn't start out to be an aviator though. You enlisted in the Navy at 17. I did. I did. I um I wanted to get away from home. <laughs> so, uh, and and where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Pittsburgh and I, I moved around a little bit because my parents were divorced and I, my, my mom had moved to a couple of different states and I literally went to a different high school in a different state every year. And I just remember this driving need to get out on my own and my parents could not afford for us to go to college. Um, and so my sister had entered the Navy a year before um, I graduated and it seemed like a great option. And I had this thing for airports. I loved airports mm -hmm. because my mom was a reservation ticket agent. So when I went down and talked to the recruiter, I took the test and the air traffic control um, MOS was available. So that's what I did uh, for a couple of years. I came into the Navy and did that. You, uh, uh, go back to school in the Navy before becoming a Naval flight officer. So, right. uh, neat. so University yeah. of Idaho. <laughs> yeah. Idaho. My parents were Pittsburgh. like, where is that? Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. Okay. What is it? Is the uh, mascot the spud or something? I don't know. Uh, a vandal. It's the monster. Yeah, it's vandals. the Idaho okay. vandals. The vandals. Yeah. There you go. Hey, uh, so you, when you get out of the Navy, um, tell us a little bit about that. You, um, uh, you know, just talk about the start of your business career. And then I want to dive into your first book, sure. Military Fly Moms. These are, this is a collection of stories, isn't it? Right, it is. So when I, I have an unusual um, end of the military career in such that I, um, first of all, my last five years in the military was not flying. I had transitioned to a new community called AEDO, Aerospace Engineering Duty Officer. And I was involved as um, in um, 
the um, program management um, side of the Navy acquisition for the aviation programs and aircraft. I was uh, stationed on at Naval Air Station Patuxent River where NAV Air is. And I was a, a program manager in um, the EA6B program office. And it was a really excellent opportunity to kind of set me up for my after the military, you know, career. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, and then also I didn't get married until I was 39. So d during my last tour at Pax River, I got married. Um, then I didn't have my first child until I was 42 the year I retired from the Navy. Yeah, late and bloomer. I am, I am. So my husband and I are old parent, old, we're, we're tired. Our kids are teenagers and we're, we're tired. They're keeping <laughs> so, you young. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that's what I did when I got out. I, um, you know, I only wanted to work part-time because I, you know, I really wanted to have kids. I was really excited to have kids and I wanted to put, you know, a lot of my time and effort into that. And so I worked part-time for the next 12 years as a defense contractor for different, um, you know, defense type companies. And during that time period, um, I had had this vision about telling women veterans stories. And obviously what I knew is I knew women aviators. And um, I, my husband had encouraged me, he was talking to a, a um, an editor of a, or a publisher, and um, he was telling her about my story. And she said, Oh, she should write a book. And so I just started thinking about it. And but I really felt like my story was such a small part of a, of a bigger story. And I just started on and it's continued to this day. Um, that's my MO is telling women's women veteran stories. And so it took me eight years. Because I, I then after I had my first son, three years later, I had my second son. And um, so, um, you know, I was busy with that. So it took me eight years. I think I interviewed over 200 women aviators, all military branches. We ended up with 70 women in the book, Military Fly Moms. It's a coffee table style book. And each woman has a picture in the book and she has her story. Like uh, it tell, talks about um, how, she, you know, where she grew up, uh, what made is there, her- Is there one in particular that just kind of jumps out at you that maybe you could share a little- um, there's so many great stories. You know, it's so um, funny because when I go back and reread the stories or look at them, it's like I fall in love with the women all over again. Right. There's so many great stories. And um, I'm trying to think if there's one that really jumps out. You know, I'll talk about one that who's who's pretty well known, actually, um, who's a good friend of mine. She she and I flew together. She was in my wedding. I We've been friends mm -hmm. for a very long time is uh, Tammy Jo Schultz. Mm -hmm. And people um, may know that name because she was the Southwest Airline pilot who yeah, landed that crippled crisis. aircraft. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so she's out of the published. airplane. The engine blew up or something. And yep. And one her person lost their life, I think. Yeah, you know, women lost their life. But Tammy Jo, like like a lot of the women, she grew up um, looking to the skies and saying, I want to do that. I want to fly. And she was told in college, she, I think she went to a meeting that was about aviation at her college. And she walked in. This might be another woman's story, too, but very similar to um, the many of the women where they would go to a meeting or they go to a recruiter and they would say, ah, you know, thank you, but no, thank you. But, um, you know, and Tammy Jo, she, and I'm very familiar with her story of when she was in the military, she received a lot of pushback from other aviators in her squadron um, and in her training specifically. And she just kept persevering. I mean, she, um, it, she has an amazing attitude um, and just very positive. And she didn't let you know, no, stop her. And it's very similar to, you know, a lot of this, all the stories are very different, but they all have like this um, familiar thread that weaves itself throughout all the stories that the women just did not take no for an answer. And they just kept pressing forward. And um, just a lot I of really recall, impressive. you know, people being impressed about how calm she was in that crisis. Yeah. Situation. And that's her personality. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, she, she must have been going through her OODA loops and, you know, just, you know, it doesn't do any good to get uh, frantic, right, in a, in a bad situation, staying calm helps her keep people alive. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I always wonder, I've, I've had a number of authors on my program, you know, did you ever think you would be an author? Uh, you know, is, is, was there some shining moment where you 
<laughs> gosh, you know, I, I, I like this writing thing. No, no. And, I, and, and I'm a one book person. I will never do another book. Yeah, okay. <laughs> one and, okay. Linda I'm Maloney glad I did one it. and done. Okay. <laughs> I loved it. We it will was... not be, you need to get copies of the book now because there is not going to be another one. Yeah. So, so it was good. So I'm now, glad did it, but yeah, it was a lot of work. <laughs> So, you know, I've been accused of being a speech seeking a podium. Uh, you you run a speaking agency. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Women veteran speakers. So I uh, got involved in the speaking community uh, um, due to my book. I, you know, I was speaking to different. And by the way, I'm listening intently because, you know, I, I literally am a speech seeking a, you know, podium uh, and yeah. more importantly, maybe an audience. But uh, yeah. I guess it's important to have something to say too, right? You know what? That's so important that, that, that yeah, absolutely. But um, so I, you know, I shared my story at different events and, um, and at the same time period, my husband was growing in his career and he was traveling a lot. And plus my kids were very small and I just could not travel to the degree that I needed to. And mm -hmm. um, I just, I had teamed with another woman veteran about 10 years ago, and she and I were collaborating about just how to highlight women veterans and to tell our story, because she and I had a um, shared, um, I think, perspective or opinion that many times the media portrays us as only a certain kind of person. And that it's not a complete view of who we are. And not that it doesn't happen, but we're portrayed a lot as victims or, or women that experience military sexual trauma. And not that that doesn't happen, but there's a, there's a whole bunch of other women that don't experience that or doing other things or not homeless, like we're portrayed as being homeless all the time. It's and like not, it's all, all veterans. Uh, they're either homeless yeah. or PTSD or suicidal, yeah. right? Well, it, yeah. it, it, those are serious problems, but yes. the vast majority of us are around you all the time. You don't even realize it. Right. And so she and I just had this mission to educate the public on who women veterans were so we had started a small women speakers agency 10 years ago and she but there were like five of us six of us and um and so we she and i just really wanted to learn the ropes about the speaking industry and then about five years ago i wanted to grow the business and i wanted to change up the business model a bit but she's she's like me she has her hands in way too many things and mm -hmm. very busy so she couldn't put the time in so i took it over changed the name changed our business model and, um, you know, initially I was primarily a speaker's bureau, but after the pandemic last year, I, for a lot of reasons, um, I decided to change up the business model again, and we're now more of a connection agency. And we are, we do book speakers, but we also, most of our members, they're either speakers, coaches, trainers, or facilitators, 90% of them have their own established business. And they're used to booking their own events. They don't particularly need a speaker's agency or a speaker's bureau. So the, the, the purpose, the mission of Women Veteran Speakers now is really to highlight women veteran speakers, coaches, trainers, facilitators. So we do a lot of marketing. We highlight them that way. We, we also are available to book, but um, yeah, we, we changed it up a little bit. And um, I think we're at maybe we had started out with about 50 women and we changed up the, the um, business model. We lost a couple because they have to pay a certain membership fee per year to be part of the agency. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we're looking to grow to a uh, hundred by the end of the year, hundred women. And we're pretty, I mean, we're pretty picky. Like we, I really am protective of our brand and um, you know, all the women obviously are veterans, but all of them have a very varied um, skill set. I or um, I say a lot of different expertise in their toolbox of skills. And so there's, so, a, there's a group out there called Afterburner, which yes. I think teaches yep. a lot of you know uh, applying military school skills to business, right? And they have speakers. Right. I mean, but but you have a wide variety of speakers on varied topics, and and 
and, and they would go to events or company events. So it's, you know, who would be the customer, so to speak? And so our target market is corporate. And, and I listed in, in terms of revenue generating, obviously, but corporate is our number one uh, professional organizations, you know, um, different groups, um, organizations that have, you know, conferences and, you know, events, and then colleges and universities is also a big one. And then last but not least are veteran related groups. And I, I put them at the bottom because they many times veteran related organizations don't have very much funding to hire. These are um, veteran service organizations. Yeah. And charities, so, right? Yeah. But number You're one. You're helping them important. raise money in, in, uh, yeah. in that setting. Um. Well, they have different types of events, but, um, you know, most of our uh, members, um, I wouldn't say most of them, maybe, maybe 60% of them, that's their full-time business. Some of the women do a part-time. So, um, you know, they have, um, you know, uh, speaker fees and travel related expenses. Right. And, um, so the, whoever, yeah, right. whoever's hiring them has to be able to, you know, c come up with those funds. Now, you told me you weren't going to do another book, but you're involved in a, as a project director for Proudly She Served, which among one of the things they're doing is a coffee table book. Right? <laughs> but so, I'm not the one, I'm not the one doing the book. Someone else on my team is. <laughs> tell, tell everybody about Proudly She Served. What's that project about? Okay, so Proudly She Served, this started about three years ago, and I had gotten connected with this um, New York-based artist. His name is Steve Alpert. And um, he um, started telling me about this project that he wanted to start. He had painted a woman veteran and he um, had gotten involved in painting veteran or military related paintings um, about 10 years ago. And he had this vision that he wanted to do this portrait series of women active duty and veterans. And so he and I just started building this project. He, I always say though, he he was like one of those little nappy little dogs that, that nip, at, nip at your heels. Like he kept after me and after me and after me and my plate's already so full. Dog, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I have one of those dogs. Um, but um, so I, he, Steve and I have been great partners. I mean, he and I are like siblings from, from different mothers, you know, we, but we, we complement each other very well. He lives nearby. I live in New Jersey. He lives in New York. So our spouses, we've all gotten together before, but um, so we started this project. We, I mean, we've done everything from the, you know, just from the ground up, we've, you know, got our logo and our name and we've, we built this whole team. We have a website, proudlyshoeserve.com. Um, we've had a social media uh, campaign going since last May. But the whole purpose of this project is to highlight women veterans and highlight why they serve. And um, and also, you know, in, in um, parallel to that is also inspiring young women and also young men too, but inspiring young women that they can do whatever they want. And, um, and also be to, politically incorrect or, or stick my neck out, but are you going to send Tucker Carlson a copy of this book? Maybe You know uh, what? The funny thing is, let me tell you, he's what I love. I've in the past, I really appreciate him. He's gotten and himself I, in trouble. He really week. has. And I'm so disappointed. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. I think he's, I, I think he probably regrets what he said. And I'm, I was very disappointed to, to hear that. And um, I totally am not in agreement uh, with those remarks at all. But um, yeah, all, all yes. in, in the vein of all publicity is good when you're in the media, I guess, you know, he's, you know, you know what I thought about that, too. I thought, you know, I guess uh, it creates hype and, you know, <laughs> I don't know, ratings and all that, you yeah. know, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've said before on, on some other um, posts I've made about that was that the plane, whatever the aircraft, the um, whatever the military piece of equipment is, it does not know if you're a woman or a man. You know, it doesn't care. The enemy doesn't know either. You know, I mean, you you got into the Navy in the '80s, right? What yep. you know? Uh, how is how has being a woman in the military changed over this period of time? Uh, you know, I think it's changed a lot depending on the service. I, I you know, and, and I do get, um, I have a very wide network um, of military and veteran, active duty and, and veteran. And so sometimes it disappoints me when I hear certain things. Um, I think the Air Force is just right on it. I really do. I think that they've done a really good job. And I think overall the Navy has too. I sometimes see things from 
the army and the and the Marine Corps, not to call them out, but that it is harder. It is harder, um, you know, and also for some communities, I think it is harder um, to integrate women into their forces. And I know for myself, um, you know, during that whole time period after tail hook and whenever women right. were transitioning to combat squadrons, I was in the first group of women to transition to a combat squadron and on an aircraft carrier. And it was very difficult. I mean, I, I would, I would absolutely do things differently myself if I had to go back and redo it because, you know, I have a lot more experience, but I mean, it was painful. It was, it was a, a lot. It was painful, <laughs> but I learned a lot. It they were great life lessons. Would you do it over again? I would. I would knowing what I know now. <laughs> oh, my gosh, if we knew yeah. then what we know now, how much better would we be? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I, I I would. It was just the the military. Not a bought Apple stock, I can assure oh, you. It's Starbucks, Starbucks stock. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah. I always say that the military offered me the most incredible opportunities. Uh, for for being a woman and being a citizen, I could never repay the military for all the opportunities it provided me. Well, I, I am sure that it, it did a lot to shape your life. I, you know, I, I told you this was going to happen. Can you believe that 30 minutes is going by? Oh my gosh, by? I know, yeah. <laughs> uh, we've had fun. Our, our guest has been Linda Maloney. She's an award-winning author. She's got the book, Military Fly Moms. I encourage people to check that out. She's also a speaker and the CEO of her own company, company Women Veteran Speakers Agency. Linda, thank you for stepping into the spotlight. I really appreciate you sharing your story. Uh, uh, boy, not many women have been shot out of an ejection seat. So. Yeah, maybe you could tell my kids that they're not very impressed. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's just, you yeah. know, I know it's just part of yeah, it. Come on, mom. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah I know. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> Well, listen, you've been listening to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. We bring veterans and military spouses who are making a difference in our community to you every week. Our guest has been Linda Maloney. Linda, again, thank you very much for stepping into the Spotlight. Bravo Zulu to you. And that's a wrap. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Spotlight by Veteran Crowd. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and uploads, please visit our website at veterancrowdnetwork.com. We'll see you next time.